A very good morning to all of you. I welcome you all to the ICANN initiative, the Hindu and Indian Express analysis. So uh, thank you for such a good amount of response that you have given to the feedback that I asked from all of you. Uh, give me one or two more days to go through your responses and uh, see w what is it that I can implement. Uh, for today, uh, what I have tried to do is uh, something that most of you have asked to link the topics to the syllabus. So that one I have tried to incorporate today. So uh, give me one more one or two days more time. So I'll see what other things that I can incorporate. And today uh, I thought of recording the uh, story of the day or the personality of the day at the last. But then when I ended the discussion with the discussion of the question, I figured out it was already a recording of one hour. So today we will be skipping with the uh, motivation of the day and directly start with the topics. We will start with the first topic of the day, which is the law and order issue. So this whole thing is about the killing of the gangster Vikas Dubey. Uh, and we know that in the recent news, we had seen how Vikas Dubey, a gangster against whom more than 60 criminal cases has been pending. Um, so he, uh, he and his uh, members had uh, killed nearly eight policemen in Kanpur. And uh, after that, the most recent news is that uh, Vikas Dubey has been now killed in an encounter. So this article, these editorials were mostly focused on the how the in the among the police there is an increasing tendency, or there is a growing um, culture of encounter. So there is this encounter culture that is uh, seen uh, among the police, and uh, this whole editorial discussion about that. So uh, many times it so happens that the police. Uh, undertake these encounters and we have also had issues in the past and reports in the past which have pointed out at the fake encounters or extrajudicial uh, killings which are the fake ones and the staged ones. So this is going to violate law and order and uh, is also against the uh, rights of the accused. So in this case what requires to be done? And the first important thing is the accountability. So the police should be made accountable for their actions. So uh, these fake encounters and extrajudicial killings, so they are not giving the person a, a fair opportunity of being heard. So police will have to be made accountable for their actions whenever such encounters happen. So there has to be an independent magisterial inquiry into it and see what made the police open fire on the accused. Uh, so that accountability is fixed for uh, against those police officers who unnecessarily uh, open fire and uh, kill the accused. Second is the due process. Always due process needs to be followed, which requires a fair and a transparent trial to be given to the accused. And uh, apart from this, uh, uh, only after a fair and uh, transparent trial is given, the establishment of guilt can be done. So then the guilt needs to be established and then punishment needs to be given. So there cannot be short circuiting of this whole due process and this needs to be followed always at any cost. And the third thing is the rule of law. So uh, in this whole thing, when there is uh, this instant justice that is happening, so always there uh, will be breach of rule of law. So rule of law is a fundamental um, aspect of our constitution and uh, it's a basic structure of the constitution and it should not be violated. Rule of law should always be preserved in spirit and that is uh, that is the spirit of the constitution as well. So therefore, whenever there is social sanction of instant justice, there is a demand by the mob, demand by the people, demand by society for instant justice by state agents like police, then it leads to um, violence against the accused and then it leads to breach of rule of law. So there should never be any short circuiting of rule of law and it should always be preserved at any cost. And the fourth is the role of courts. So courts have in the past also uh, through various judgments have laid down various guidelines which will have to be followed by the police. So these guidelines may include uh, something like within uh, 24 hours there will have to be an FIR against the police officers who are involved uh, in the encounter and uh, immediate autopsy has to be done uh, for the person who for the accused who has been killed. So like that various guidelines have been um, put forward by the courts which will have to be observed. Even the uh, National Human Rights Commission, the State Human Rights Commissions have also been giving their guidelines uh, 
regarding the fake encounters and these guidelines will have to be always uh, adhered to and uh, nhrcs and shrcs can also ad uh, adopt an approach whereby they can uh, monitor the compliance of these guidelines by the police so the role of courts and nhrcs become very important and they should not adopt a lenient approach in such case next is an atmosphere of impunity which should never be there so now the police fe uh, feel that even if they are uh, conducting an encounter which uh, may be fake or may be genuine but there won't be any independent uh, judicial inquiry into it so as to ascertain what made the police open fire so this is going to create a culture of impunity among the police that they can open fire on the accused uh, even when there is no genuine reason to do so so this culture of impunity should be removed and accountability needs to be fixed the uh, whenever encounters happen they need to be thoroughly investigated whether it was needed or not and then if it was just a uh, uh, abuse of the power by the police then they will need to be uh, appropriate action needs to be taken against them so these are the important uh, issues next is the uh -huh. supreme court judgments in 2020 and this is related to the criminalization of politics now this whole episode of the vikas dube the gangster has also uh, put forward has, has also thrown light on the prevalence of criminalization of politics uh, in indian polity so uh, way back the nn vohra report had also pointed out in 1990s itself about this unholy nexus between the criminals politicians and the police so this episode again points out to the fact that um, these uh, nexus between the politicians and the criminals and police exists to this day it not just exists but rather it is only increased so uh, when we talk about this criminalization of politics uh, there is an important supreme court judgment uh, that was given in 2020 february itself supreme court said that um, whenever a political party is selecting a criminal candidate a criminal person as a candidate then it will have to give reasons as to why that candidate who is already having some criminal cases pending against him or her is being selected by the political party as a candidate and also the political parties will have to give reasons for non-selection that is they have to tell precisely why a particular candidate who has no criminal records who has no criminal cases pending against him or her has not been selected as a candidate for the elections so that reason also uh, the political parties will have to give so this uh, judgment can have very far-reaching consequences as far as criminalization of politics so uh, apart from the supreme court judgment there is also a 2009 andhra pradesh uh, andhra high court judgment so this judgment um, again it told that uh, whenever any uh, encounters happen then uh, there has to be a mandatory fir that will be registered against the police and uh, after this fir it should be a judicial magistrate who would decide what the next step would be so after every encounter there, there has to be a mandatory reg registration of fir against the police officers and then uh, the judicial magistrate will have to decide the next step so this was told by the andhra high court in a 2009 judgment and also supreme court in uh, pucl versus state of maharashtra in 2014 it laid down certain guidelines that will have to be followed to um, ensure that this, uh, such fake encounters do not happen and also uh, whenever such encounters are happening the police officials are made to be he are, are held accountable for any uh, breach of law so the court had framed guidelines in this particular case but uh, when the guidelines were formulated it was noted that these guidelines were very ambiguous so because of ambiguity in the wording of these uh, guidelines uh, these guidelines could not be implemented properly and also even when these guidelines are implemented we had discussed this point before also when it comes to prosecution prosecution is very difficult because it requires the permission of the government so uh, government needs to sanction the prosecution of the police officials which is not always easy to come so therefore the prosecution rate is also uh, very low so that is the reason why these guidelines have also not been very effective in controlling this uh, issue and also when it comes to nhrc nhrc has also been previously termed by the supreme court as a toothless tiger so this again means that even when NSA, nhrc is taking up some issues uh, 
whatever its recommendations are they are just advisory in nature and they are not binding in nature so the compliance with its guidelines it is very difficult to check whether compliance is being made or not and even if it is not being made then there is little that nhrc can do about it so this trend in the criminalization of politics we have already seen in uh, the number of mps uh, who have criminal cases against them pending it was 24% in 2004 30% in 2009, 34% in 2014 and 43% in 2019. So this trend is only increasing. So next is uh, what has to be done in the future. The first is the affidavits. So these candidates whenever they are submitting their uh, uh, papers to the election commission, they also give their affidavits regarding their qualifications, regarding their assets and liabilities, and also regarding their criminal antecedents. So these affidavits need to be made more popular. So next is uh, the, uh, more more popular as in uh, people will have to go through these affidavits and also uh, that, that should become a source of information which should be analyzed and decisions be made. Next is the role of election commission. So these affidavits are also coming to the election commission. Election commission has a lot of information available with it regarding the candidates. So these information will have to be promptly circulated on the websites of the political parties. And uh, to ensure this, that is the role of the election commission. And also this information should be circulated on social media also, because that is where uh, the reach is also going to be more and more people will know about the background of a particular candidate who is contesting in the elections and then can make a um, more informed choice whether a uh, candidate needs to be selected or not based on the criminal uh, cases which are pending against him or her. Next is a voter bribery. Uh, this is very important uh, because we need to create awareness among the voters that if a particular political party or a candidate is bribing them for their votes then they cannot be trusted. So uh, this change is slow to come by and but it will it can come so therefore this constant uh, voter awareness campaigns need to be uh, done. So this was the three way forward that was given in the editorial. Now we will move on to the next topic which is the criminal laws reform. So the other day we have already discussed that now uh, a committee has been set up by the Union Home Ministry for reforming the criminal laws. So these criminal laws include the Indian Penal Code, the Code of Criminal Procedure, Indian Evidence Act and all these. So uh, this, uh, all these acts have been our colonial legacy and it's high time that with the changing society and the changing nature of crimes, we change or we also overhaul our criminal laws. So this committee has been set up by the Ministry of Home. This was as part of the news. But then uh, now that this committee has been set up, uh, several um, lawyers, several jurists have uh, voiced out their concern regarding this. So let's see what are all the issues associated with this. First is uh, related to the time frame. Uh, but uh, before that, uh, let me just, just tell that uh, the last the previous topic that we discussed regarding criminalization of politics that comes under GS paper 2 uh, under the electoral reforms and the RPA Act and uh, all the other electoral reforms. So it comes under the topic of electoral reforms uh, that requires to be done. Now we are talking about the criminal law and the reforms that are needed. So that again comes under uh, the criminal justice system, which is again uh, comes under your GS2 paper. So now we come back to this uh, committee, which has been set up for overhauling the criminal laws. So several lawyers, advocates and activists have now voiced concern uh, over the setting up of this committee. And the first thing is regarding the time frame. So the time frame that has been given to this committee is very less and therefore the concern is that will it be able to properly scrutinize uh, all these laws and be able to come up with um, uh, meaningful changes that needs to be made in these laws. Second is the scope of these committee. The scope of the committee is also uh, is considered to be less. So uh, because of the time frame that the less time that is being given to the it is also uh, doubtful whether wide consultations with the public can be held or not. So these laws, uh, whenever we are going to reform it, it will need the consensus of the entire society. The public needs to be consulted on the kind of reforms which are needed. So these wide public consultations are not going to be possible. 
these public consultations won't be possible much not just because the time uh, w- which has been given to the committee is less but also because now we are in uh, amidst a pandemic so people getting together and people having that much um, of a time and space to be able to discuss and deliberate upon this is also less because of the other worries in the country like the pandemic so pandemic has occupied the attention of many people and uh, the resources are being diverted for the pandemic so therefore whether people will be able to contribute from uh, uh, diverse backgrounds to overhauling the criminal laws uh, at a, at the time of the pandemic is again another issue uh, next is the ambiguous mandate when you look at the mandate of this committee it says that uh, it has to reform the criminal laws in the country make it more effective and efficient and uh, so that it ensures the safety and security of individual uh, society that is community and the nation and for an individual it uh, ensures uh, the constitutional values of justice and dignity so when you look at this uh, mandate uh, the mandate seems very vague very wide open uh, to multiple interpretations so this uh, ambiguous mandate is another matter of concern Uh, regarding the setting up of the committee next is the role of law commission so law commission is already there and uh, law commission has also been entrusted with the task of uh, reviewing the laws presently uh, which are there in the country and uh, recommending any amendments needed or recommending any new laws which needs to be introduced all of this is usually the role of the law commission so it is not clear why law commission has not been entrusted with this task to see what reforms are needed in the criminal laws and why a separate committee is being created for this the next issue is a lack of diversity so when you look at the composition of the committee you see that it's an all male committee first of all and these committee members are also delhi based so therefore uh, there is a lack of diversity when it comes to the composition of the committee itself so the representation of women members is also very important because a lot of crimes in the society also happen against women and also we need people from diverse parts of the country to be uh, able to bring their own uh, experience and uh, diversity in the crimes uh, in their regions so this lack of diversity is another issue in the composition or the membership of the committee uh, so therefore what should be the way forward way forward is that whenever we are looking to overhaul the criminal laws so which are again multiple in number the ipc crpc evidence act and so many things it needs to be more inclusive so we need to adopt a more inclusive approach uh, while we are reforming these kind of laws and uh, to adopt an inclusive approach we need to uh, build a wide consensus in the society so the wide consensus need to be built on various issues like how to speed up the trials which are now very slow how do we protect the witnesses uh, now witnesses are being harassed and threatened and uh, how to improve the investigation mechanisms now many of the investigations fail they don't reach uh, the conclusion uh, so it doesn't lead to proper prosecution then how do we eliminate torture from the prisons so these are various things on which we need to uh, widely deliberate and consult and then come to a uh, consensus so these are the various issues on which we need deliberation and cons- uh, consultation and this whole process of deliberation and consultation can uh, help us develop a wide consensus and also um, appro- uh, adopt a very inclusive approach at reforming the criminal laws so this has to be our way next is the need for the fiscal council so uh, this fiscal council we will analyze what is the need of the fiscal council so first we will talk about the origin so the 13 uh, sorry the fiscal council was first uh, recommended by the 13th finance commission and even the 14th finance commission had uh, endorsed to the same and even the frbm review committee which was headed by nk singh had also recommended that there has to be a fiscal council now let's see what will be the objective of the fiscal council so first uh, even apart from india the imf data says that nearly 50 countries have uh, in the world have established fiscal councils uh, that are successful not so successful or unsuccessful so over 50 countries have um, this uh, arrangement of the sort of fiscal council now what is the objective of fiscal council first of all it's going to be a permanent body so permanent body it will be and then it's uh, going to do assessment assessment of what it will independently assess the government's fiscal plans 
and see if uh, every country is going to have its own macroeconomic uh, objectives uh, that is uh, uh, what 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 should be the limits of the inflation fiscal deficit and all that so um, it is going to make an assessment of the fiscal plans of the government against the parameters of macroeconomic sustainability next is publicity so whatever assessment it is going to make of the government's fiscal plans it is going to put that into a report and this report is going to be put in the public domain so this will help uh, the fiscal council to ensure fiscal accountability of the government so whatever the government is spending for uh, which purpose whether it has achieved the objectives so that fiscal accountability is going to be fixed on the government because um, this is going to uh, this committee is going to do an assessment and the report is going to be put in the public domain so there will be better check on the government's uh, fiscal actions next is forecasting or projections it is also going to make a projection or forecasting and these projections or the budget forecasts are going to be used by the government in the formulation of its budget so these are the important objectives that this fiscal council will uh, meet but then the real question is for meeting these objectives do we really need a fiscal council the first uh, argument against this is the frbm experience so we formulated the fiscal responsibility and budget management act way back in 2003 whereby we set limits for the fiscal deficit for the revenue deficit uh, so that the fiscal deficit has to be within the limits and revenue deficit will have to be phased uh, out uh, it has to become zero over a period of time so we had these targets but time and again this targets was relaxed and it was postponed so frbm act says that uh, government will have to conform to these targets and whenever it fails to conform to these targets it also has to explain and give reasons as to why there is a deviation from the target that has been set and also under frbm we have what is called as a fiscal policy strategy statement which the government will have to place in the parliament so this is supposed to be widely discussed in the parliament so it shows how the government is faring uh, in terms of its fiscal responsibility what has been uh, projected and what is the actual so this discussion haps, happens in the parliament so fiscal policy strategy statement is supposed to be in uh, discussed in depth in the parliament so but however if you see that uh, there is hardly any notice when the fpss is introduced in the parliament and there is hardly any uh, deliberation or discussion on the fpss so there is no demand for accountability on part of the government itself so under frbm when we already have the fiscal policy strategy statement we already have these targets which are to be kept uh, which are to be adhered to there is hardly any discussion in the parliament and there is hardly any fixing of accountability on the government so what makes us think that uh, where frbm is failing the fiscal council will be successful in this so whatever targets the fiscal council is setting is going to be uh, adhered to and uh, fiscal council whatever uh, report it is uh, giving out then that is going to be discussed in the parliament and accountability is going to be fixed so uh, what what makes us think like that so frbm experience has itself shown that this whole thing has failed then why are we creating another new uh, bureaucratic body where uh, we are just expanding the bureaucracy we are creating just uh, another permanent body an elaborate one which has an extensive uh, mandate for this task so how is that going to be different and why is that going to be more successful compared to rbm the second is the macroeconomic forecasts so the uh, fiscal council is going to uh, make some macroeconomic forecasts and this data or these projections which are made by the fiscal council are going to be used by the ministry of finance in formulating its budget but what if the ministry of finance decides to use some other data from some other source already we have the central statistics office the reserve bank of india all of them also give their own forecasts uh, uh, regarding growth and other economic macroeconomic variables these organizations also give their own forecasts so uh, not just these organizations many other private and public even international agencies give their own forecasts then first of all why uh, are we here assuming that the data that is given by the fiscal council is going to be more credible than the data and the forecasts that are provided by the other agencies that is the first thing about the credibility of data and second thing is if finance ministry is using the data provided by the fiscal council 
then tomorrow if something goes wrong if the estimates go wrong then the finance ministry will directly shift the blame to the fiscal council but if finance ministry is using its own data then at least it will it can be held more accountable for uh, being not so precise on the estimates but if uh, it relies on the data of fiscal council and if the estimates go wrong then it will shift the blame on fiscal council so this is the second issue regarding macroeconomic forecast third is the creative accounting so it is said that uh, the government uh, often resorts to creative accounting so uh, even now uh, the government does resort to creative account some accounting sometimes which means just uh, you know dressing up the accounts to show that uh, uh, the fiscal the health of the country is more sound for example uh, the government may show in its accounts such that uh, uh, the expenditure may be postponed to the next fiscal to show that the expenditure was less so all these uh, tactics may be adopted by the government to show that the financial health of the country is more sound so that is called as creative accounting so even now creative accounting happens and the controller and auditor general of india the cag audit is going to check that so if this mechanism of cag audit has lost its effectiveness to check the tendency of creative accounting then we have to fix this we have to strengthen the cag audits such that the tendency of creative accounting is curbed so rather than increasing the power of this cag audit we are trying to create another costly bureaucratic structure so uh, this is only going to increase our expenses on this bureaucratic structure rather what we can also do is just to strengthen and fix the weaknesses in the cag audit so that the creative accounting can be checked so this is uh, another possibility which can, can be done rather than setting up a new fiscal council which will just end up creating another bureaucratic structure so what should be the way forward this editorial was written by former uh, rbi chairman subarao so you can quote uh, subarao as a former a former rbi chairman and the way forward that he has given so he says that under the uh, cag uh, cag can form a three member committee and this three member committee will scrutinize the budget presented by the government and it will make a report which will be put in the public domain the cag is going to provide all the secretarial and the logistic support to this three member committee so once the public report on the fiscal stance of the government on the fiscal performance of the government is uh, put up in the public domain and the three member committee has completely scrutinized the budget and the report is made public then uh, the committee can also be wound up and um, this report then uh, cac can again scrutinize this report and this report can be scrutinized and discussed in the parliament and the fiscal responsibility uh, and accountability can be fixed on the government so for that we this can be the starting point if we feel that this is becoming more successful we can think of creating a more permanent body rather than winding it up so as an experiment as a pilot phase we can set up uh, we can have this kind of a setup and check it out whether it is uh, working for us or not so now on to the next topic which is cooperative federalism so um, first of all when we talk of cooperative federalism which we have also previously covered uh, in i can videos so we say that the 14th finance commission so the 14th finance commission uh, recommendations which were accepted in 2005 it increased the devolution from 32 to 42% so that is 42% of the central pool of taxes is going to be devolved to the state governments so this was heralded as a milestone in the cooperative federalism because now the states have more devolved funds with them and they have been given more fiscal autonomy but uh, several other things have also transpired which has uh, raised questions on this concept of cooperative federalism so we will have a look at them first is the tax devolution so it says that the tax devolution to the states have uh, been in fact uh, less than the 14th finance commission projections so whatever projection has been made by the 14th finance commission regarding 42% of devolution but the actual devolution has consistently been lower compared to the 14th finance commission projections next is the gst again so gst again uh, snatched away from the states their uh, uh, right to tax several things so uh, the states have also lost their several parts of their tax kitty now has come under an integrated goods and services tax 
so even under this uh, this again was uh, given as an example as a milestone in the cooperative federalism where the states have surrendered their rights to tax um, in the interest of one nation one tax but in this when it comes to the gst collections the gst collections have also been lower than the expectation for 2018-19 the shortfall in the gst collection was 22% when it was compared to the projections so for 2018-19 whatever was projected to be the gst collection but the actual collection was 22% shorter than that so this is related to collection next is the delay in the compensation so when the gst was introduced in the initial years the state uh, would lose some amount of their revenue because they are transferring their right to tax on several subjects so the center uh, got the cooperation or won the cooperation of the states uh, by promising to the states that whenever there is any revenue shortfall or uh, there is going to be a revenue shortfall and the states are going to get their compensation for a period of 5 years from the implementation of gst so that any shortfall in the revenue uh, there will be this compensation for the states but there has been a delay in the compensation that the center owes to the state also uh, for instance uh, in november december in december 2019 and uh, january 2020 the center owed the states nearly 35000 crore but this compensation due was only paid in the month of june which there was a delay of 5 months and uh, also it was during this period that the states uh, precisely fa- were uh, was also facing the increasing curve in the pen- pandemic and they needed more assistance and monetary resources so but still the compensation was delayed and this leads to a lot of financial crunch in the states and their ability to uh, properly and effectively respond to the pandemic so this delay in the compensation issue has also there so the issue is the imposition of the cesses so the government the central government has also imposed a number of cesses and the cess doesn't form a part of the divisible pool of taxes the next important factor is the welfare spending so a lot of the uh, welfare related subjects they fall under the state list and the state is responsible for spending on these so uh, one is uh, the health education uh, agriculture all these spending is done by the state governments in 2014 and 2015 the states undertook programs and uh, projects and they were spending 46% more than the spending by the central government but now it states are spending 64% more than the central government on various of these schemes and projects so the welfare spending of the states is also more so it is in uh, because of this again we feel that there has to be more uh, parity between the center and the states when it comes to their financial uh, autonomy and also the broader concept of cooperative federalism next is the fiscal deficit limits so even the fiscal deficit limits uh, for the states under frbm the center has increased that limit from 3% to 5% but out of this increase only 0.5% increase is going to be unconditional but the remaining 1.5% um, increase in this fiscal deficit limit uh, that the states uh, can avail is dependent on the states fulfilling certain um, reform measures so this includes uh, the power distribution companies which has to be privatized then uh, the urban local bodies increasing their level of revenues so on all these reforms this limit of 1.5% uh, is available for the states so therefore even in the fiscal deficit limits when the states are spending more they still do, do not have that much amount of liberty in the fiscal sphere so a lot of restrictions are imposed on them and these are the arguments that uh, we have discussed till now which shows uh, a tendency which is against the cooperative federalism so you may have a question in gs2 what is cooperative federalism and uh, to what extent this concept is put to practice so then you can use these arguments as a counter to the concept of cooperative federalism saying that the cooperative federalism is not actually there so we move on to the next topic which is uh, regarding solar energy so this will come under uh, gs3 paper Uh, you have a topic called as energy infrastructure uh, and all that so under this um, under energy uh, the solar energy topic will come so the recent uh, news is that the prime minister has inaugurated a 750 megawatt solar power project in reva so this is the most recent and related to that prime minister in this while inaugurating this uh, project in reva he said that the solar energy has three main uh, obstacles in india which we need to 
work upon one is that we need to manufacture um, effective solar panels within the country and not rely on imports so a lot of solar panels were being imported now and uh, prime minister has said that we need uh, improved solar panels uh, that to domestic production of these improved solar panels is very important second is the batteries so improved batteries is also another area where we are lagging behind and this again needs to be improved third is the storage so uh, it is a lack of storage technologies so when the sun is there the energy is getting generated but then it's a storage and then uh, its transportation and usage is again the uh, major uh, area where india is lagging behind so storage of the solar energy is another important area on which uh, we need to improve also the prime minister has uh, made a comment that the solar energy is sure pure and secure so this can be used uh, in the conclusion or in the introduction or whenever you have any question on uh, the solar energy so prime minister has made a comment while inaugurating this uh, 750 megawatt solar power project in reva that uh, solar panels sorry the solar energy is sure pure and secure sure why because um, the conventional fossil fuels are going to get exhausted but uh, the solar energy is surely going to be available forever next is pure because uh, it's not environmentally polluting it's environmentally friendly so it is pure and it is secure because uh, the solar energy uh, which india abundantly has being a tropical country is going to uh, make us uh, energy secure so uh, the energy security from that point of view it is secure so the solar energy is sure pure and secure so this was about the solar next is um, the drones uh, which can come under usage of technology or the national security issue so uh, again technology and applications of various technology it comes under gs3 drones and its various applications we have already uh, discussed in detail in the previous videos and national security issue again comes under gs3 uh, under the security topic so uh, the issue that was in this uh, topic was that Uh, earlier the pakistan based syndicates and, and various other terror outfits they were smuggling drugs and also some illegal weapons across the india pakistan border through the thar desert of rajasthan because the desert was very vast and uh, the pakistan also had well trained food uh, couriers so these food couriers in the vast desert of rajasthan it is very difficult to detect so that's how uh, pakistan used to smuggle drugs across and uh, india and illegal weapons but now with the evolution of technology they have shifted the uh, camel bags from camel bags they have shifted to drones so now rather than using the camel bags for smuggling of drugs and weapons they are using drones now so cross border smuggling is now happening using drones and uh, drones are again very difficult to detect so this requires more smart, uh, smarter broader uh, sorry border management so smart border management is very important uh, we had what are called as drone jammers so drone jammers are found to be very ineffective and they are not able to control the operation of the drones so several drones like that creep into the border and they have been able to deliver uh, drugs and also illegal weapons so uh, this way for instance recently where uh, a pakistani drone was detected by the border security force uh, in um, uh, so this uh, drone it contained uh, several uh, Uh, it contained a rifle it contained uh, grenades so like that various weapons are also being delivered using drones so therefore we need smart border management which are going to detect these kind of drones and are also going to pull them down so these drone jammers are not effective so therefore you can say that how the drones can be used for smuggling uh, drugs and illegal weapons which is the negative side of uh, technology and on and also as a national security issue we have the issue of uh, drug smuggling illegal uh, arms import uh, arms smuggling and illegal uh, immigration so these are all the various issues that happen at the border so when we talk of the national security this is very important uh, it calls for smarter border management so you can have a question like there are various issues across the border but we uh, we have very ineffective border management so what reforms do we need to have a smart border management so in this regard you can say how there is a shift from uh, the manual food soldiers from the camel bags to the sorry the food couriers and camel bags to uh, uh, the drones which are a technological evolution so how at the same time with the evolution of technology uh, 
and how the drones are being used for smuggling we also need to evolve the technology and use it to for smart border management so you can make out a case for smart border management using this as an example so this is related to border issue next is the functioning of the parliament in the past we have already seen multiple times uh, how various countries across the world they are experimenting with either uh, virtual meetings of the parliament to discuss various uh, critical issues or um, they are just limiting uh, to the physical the number of people uh, or they are uh, they are adopting hybrid model where some of them are connecting virtually over the internet and some of them are physically present so that the social distancing norms are also maintained but uh, after march the parliament of india has not convened and uh, uh, it is very important that the parliament convenes so this whole editorial was regarding that that once the lockdown started in on march 23rd uh, according to prs legislative research so according to prs legislative research the central government has issued nearly 850 covid related notifications and it is also promulgated 11 ordinances so uh, 11 ordinances and 850 covid related notifications that is a huge number so government has done a lot of uh, restrictions on the freedom like uh, the international travel restrictions then uh, prohibitions on export of ventilators then mandating the use of arogya setu uh, which has which has uh, given out which has sparked controversies uh, and questions related to the privacy of the data so whether the actions taken by the government are proportional uh, whether they are actually needed for this meeting the crisis the issue related to the migrants and the steps taken by the government there are various issues on which the government has taken a lot of steps but then because the parliament has not met these steps have not been discussed in the parliament and as a consequence accountability is not being fixed on the government for its actions so uh, therefore uh, what is this resulted to is that government is undertaking a lot of actions it uh, its power is getting enlarged it is imposing more restrictions uh, which can which can have an uh, an impact on the, the privacy of uh, of the population but then it is not uh, answerable to various measures that it is taking so it needs to be held accountable and for that the parliament must meet as soon as possible so when the meeting of the parliament uh, uh, con- uh, the idea comes up one excuse or rather one issue that is pointed out is that uh, uh, the parliament uh, maybe in the virtual meeting uh, several confidential issues are there and they cannot be discussed over a virtual meeting uh, because of the threat of some uh, cyber attacks so the, the one way to mitigate this is to use um, call upon the services of nic's nic technological prowess can be used and uh, we can have a very cyber secure uh, way of virtually meeting across the, the internet and uh, we can discuss various matters of uh, critical importance and uh, that way parliament can also be held accountable and uh, the meetings can happen and these various measures that the parliament has taken are also deliberated consulted and discussed and only then taken so this uh, is regarding the functioning of parliament next is the role of e-commerce so this is an example uh, in karnataka where uh, the flipkart has this platform called as samarth platform so under samarth platform uh, flipkart it uh, usually partners with the several local uh, artisans and weavers and craftsmen and uh, allow them to uh, sell their products online so under this uh, samarth platform the flipkart has signed uh, an agreement uh, an mou with the uh, karnataka government the department of msme mines and uh, under government of karnataka the two have uh, signed an mou so under this uh, various artisans craftsmen and weavers of karnataka will be able to uh, sell their hallmark products uh, and this will increase first the customer base for uh, uh, the these sellers these traditional artisans and weavers it will increase the customer base because these uh, online platforms the e-commerce platforms have a wider reach so it is going to give them new business and uh, trade opportunities for these segments uh, and the, the thirdly it is also going to uh, trust the make in india uh, because it is going to spur domestic manufacturing because these manufacturers these traders and weavers are going to find new market and new customers so under the samarth platform the flipkart is going to provide incubation support 
it is also helping these uh, weavers and artisans in cataloging in marketing and also in the account management so in all of these things warehousing warehousing support is also being given by uh, uh, flipkart through the samarth platform so this is uh, this you can use it as a role of uh, e-commerce in uh, the role of e-commerce e how e-commerce can play a role in the country so in this uh, its role in enhancing the market reach and penetration for these uh, poor weavers and artisans and thereby promoting the traditional art and craft is also one important role that the e-commerce plays so uh, the role of e-commerce in uh, development can be used and this comes un uh, under uh, gs3 where you can talk about e technology uh, so under that e technology also you can talk about e commerce which is the application of e technology so uh, you can talk of the samarth platform so you can have a full fledged question on e commerce itself that what role are they playing what is government of india's policy towards e commerce and what modifications are needed so this is a very uh, e commerce is one topic which is uh, always in news so you have to prepare that so you can talk of flipkart's samarth platform so next is uh, freedom versus security so in this uh, basically what uh, uh, it talks about the recent ban of uh, nearly 59 chinese apps by the government and uh, government has also been using section 69a of the information technology act whereby certain websites can be uh, blacklisted or banned by the government and access to such websites can be restricted by the government under section 69a of the information technology act so whether it is banning of the apps or the section 69a so what these things are leading to is it is uh, restricting the individual freedom it is restricting the freedom of an individual to be able to freely access internet and one of the most important reasons given for these uh, restrictions is the national security that some particular website is compromising the national security and integrity of india similarly these chinese apps were uh, had privacy concerns and they are also compromising india's national security so this national security is the reason that is given for various restrictions that are being imposed this way so in the uh, there are several issues first is the international conventions india is a signatory to international convention on civil and political rights india is also a signatory to the universal declaration of human rights so all of these require that some basic uh, human rights standards are preserved so there is a certain understanding that regulation of internet or internet based services by the governments uh, they will have to adhere to these uh, basic human rights standards so india is a signatory to these two conventions and even while regulating the internet it has to keep in mind that that is in consonance with uh, the basic human rights standards so uh, again imposing unnecessary restrictions uh, will go against the spirit of these conventions second is a fundamental right we have a freedom of expression under article 19 so this is going to be violated if these uh, restrictions are uh, Uh, are disproportionate and uh, they do not serve ob the purpose and they are not objective then it is going to impinge on the spirit of article 19 which talks of freedom of expression the next issue is uh, rather than the issue uh, whenever some restriction is uh, imposed by the government usually to test whether this restriction is fair or not a three part test uh, is always applied one is the clear action so whatever the issue is whether imposing such restriction is the clear action that can be taken to tackle that issue so that is the first test second is intrusive so whenever any measure is uh, or any restriction is imposed by the government the question asked is is there any other less intrusive method than this uh, which can solve the problem so if there is a less intrusive method than this uh, method then that less intrusive method needs to be used so always the least intrusive method needs to be used so this is the second question that is asked and the third is a proportionality proportionality the doctrine of proportionality says that uh, whatever restriction is being imposed is that in proportion to the objective or the end that the government seeks to achieve so uh, if the restrictions imposed is very disproportionate to the objective that the government wants to achieve then it will defeat the test of proportionality and such a restriction is going to be uh, it can be termed as uh, more ambiguous and uh, uh, it will not stand the uh, stand in court 
so this is deep three part test which will any restrictions imposed by the government is going to be put to to see if that restrictions are uh, meant for um, bona fide reasons or not. so the example given here is of section 69a of the information technology act so when the shreya single judgment happened the supreme court struck down section 66 of the information technology act uh, but then it did not strike down section 69a of the information technology act as i have already said section 69a is about blacklisting and banning certain websites which go against uh, uh, let's say national security or sovereignty so uh, whenever government has invoked section 69a to restrict or to ban any websites or anything it has always cited confidentiality as the reason why it is not making these public that is government is not giving out in public any information or details regarding uh, the reasons why certain websites have been banned rather it is just given a generic thing like national security or anything but it has always maintained confidentiality regarding the reason why section 69a has been imposed on certain websites but when we come to the anuradha bhasian judgment in the recent uh, recently and the supreme court was uh, uh, looking into the matter of uh, restrictions on the internet speed in jammu and kashmir the supreme court clearly in its judgment uh, told that whenever people's rights or to liberty are being blocked especially when it relates to the freedom over the internet then the reasons need to be published clearly so that was what the supreme court told in the anuradha bhasian judgment so therefore uh, even when the government is imposing such restrictions it will have to come out more in the open and it will have to publish why uh, certain restrictions have been imposed like why some websites are being banned so that has to be put in the public domain entire information needs to be put in the public domain so that will ensure that again there is a balance between the enjoyment of freedom and the uh, important considerations like the national security so again you can expect this topic in gs2 where you talk about the basic principles of the constitution so uh, and uh, on the one hand you have the freedom of expression that is article 19 but on the other hand you have the public interest or the national security so then which of that is going to stand and where do you draw the line so between these constitutional principles you can have a question so fundamental rights or uh, the national interest so there is always a dilemma between the two so this you can face even in ethics uh, paper or in the gs2 paper under the principles of constitution so in that you can quote the three part uh, uh, test that is uh, always put on these restrictions to determine if these restrictions are bona fide and uh, you can talk about these judgments like shreya singhal and anuradha bhasin to say that whenever restrictions are being put they need to be uh, explained along with the reasons and they need to be made public so that there is public review and uh, so that there are unnecessary restrictions are not imposed under the garb of national security so this you can also link it with the social contract which we uh, read just previous so next is uh, we will discuss yesterday's question so the question was on importance of community policing so first you will be defining community policing and uh, you can keep the definition very simple that it is just involvement of the civilians in law enforcement so it involves consultation uh, it involves uh, cooperation and it involves partnership with the community so you can say that uh, where uh, community policing is one wherein the law uh, abiders become law enforcers and uh, it is also said that uh, community policing is where uh, it is based on the premise that the police are civilians in uniform and civilians are police without uniform so uh, they are all a part of this society and everybody can contribute for uh, ensuring that law and order is maintained in the society so with these phrases like law why does become law enforcers you can uh, give an introduction to the topic and then you can say uh, you can uh, briefly talk about uh, say basically what are the elements that it involves it involves a partnership with the community then it is mainly uh, basically at solving the problems the problem solving between the police and the civilians and among the civilians so it is problem solving and then also it involves a transformation uh, with the organization such as the police so police has always been a very bureaucratic organization a top to bottom uh, structure 
so if this such a hierarchical organization has to involve with the community it basically involves a transformation in the from the organization point of view so that they are able to respond to the community needs uh, and be more responsive and effective at that so these can be the three elements of community policing and then you can uh, start uh, explaining the importance and when you talk about the importance uh, basically in community policing you have two stakeholders one is the police and the other is the civilians so you can say what is the importance from the civilian point of view and what is the importance from the police point of view so this way it gives your answer also a better structure and a better presentation can be uh, arrived at so when you talk of uh, the advantages from the civilian point of view they will have a uh, more safe neighborhoods and uh, they will have we will have empowered communities who take charge of their own safety and we have the grievances of the uh, people uh, better redressed so and also it will um, lead to a more peaceful and uh, it helps in a reduction in the crime rate in the society where the citizens can live fearlessly and peacefully and it also helps in developing a, a good relation with the uh, police people so that uh, the police are not always seen with a sense of fear and uh, because this collaboration with the police can uh, make the civilians comfortable about the police and the uniform so whatever the crime is the uh, civilians will muster courage and approach the police to register the cases so, and get there uh, and get justice so nowadays the reporting of the cases itself is uh, low with the police so many people don't even want to go to the police station so this tendency is going to get overcome and uh, the police have uh, the civilians will have more confidence in the police to go to the police station get their cases registered and and also fight for their justice so this is one thing and it is also going to change the perception of the police among the civilians uh, civilians have a perception that the police are very brutal they harass people and uh, uh, there is even a saying that um, civilians believe that the police are criminals in uniform so that is a kind of perception that many of the civilians have of over the police so this perception of the police is again going to be uh, bettered because of community policing and from the police point of view then for them it is easy detection of the crimes because as we had discussed they cannot be omnipresent and uh, ever uh, patrolling and also it is going to reduce their burden now would now only the police are already overburdened and they are said to be working for 14 to 16 hours a day and it is this frustration that makes them uh, you know more uh, oppressive over the civilians so they, this is going to reduce the burden on the police also and they will also have better work satisfaction because they know that uh, the citizens are satisfied with them and uh, the police will also be able to develop that uh, trust with the civilians because uh, when we transited from the police state during the colonial raj to a welfare state and then independent india uh we saw that between the civilians and the police there was a lot of trust gap and this trust gap need to be filled so the police had to build bridges with the civilians to be able to get their cooperation in resolving crimes so this uh, bridging of uh, the building of bridge uh, precisely that aim will be achieved through community policing so these are the various advantages from the you can come out with much more advantages from the police and the civilian point of view so um it is not about the number of points that we'll be discussing we'll also be focusing on the presentation so you can start with these kind of presentations where you say these are the elements of uh, community policing then you can use these phrases like law abiders becoming law enforcers and also the police being uh, civilians in uniform and civilians being police without uniform then you can use this categorization to uh, explain the advantages then you can go on to give some examples like the kerala example the janmaitri suraksha uh, in kerala in 2008 so even uh, because of this now even during the covid times so a uh, lot of cooperation could be elicited from the public by the police so it became very easy for the uh, police to monitor the community to trace the contact to reach out to the senior citizens and spread awareness so this became very useful for uh, the police in kerala due to janmaitri suraksha then in uh, assam we have what is called as the mera pai bhi so mera pai bhi is where um, see one more important thing about community policing is it aims at crime prevention rather than you know post crime uh, management it uh, aims at crime prevention itself so in mera pai bhi also um, it means torch bearers in assam where the women in assam they are going to help in improving the law and order problem they will tackle the drug abuse among the youth 
so they light their torches and uh, they go around the basti um, in patrols so they guard the entry and the exit points and uh, uh, youth who are using the drugs so that is going to be prevented uh, because of this community policing initiative in fact in the past couple of years we have uh, seen uh, communal riots happening in uh, muzaffar nagar shamli and all that so there also the police had resorted to community policing uh, where uh, the people from the community will give information to the pub, uh, to the police uh, if there are any early signs of a communal violence uh, happening if there are any uh, early warning signs that are there so all so that the crime itself can be prevented and also um, some aman committees were formed these aman committees uh, were formed where the police and the civilians both of them were involved in these committees they formed whatsapp groups and uh, they were in constant touch and these were also used to spread the message of peace and the essence of religion among the people which talks about peace and humanity and equality so that the communal violence uh, uh can be tackled and uh, these members also uh, cooperated with the police in passing the important information regarding what is the warning signs that are there in the community which can later precipitate a community uh, communal violence so with these examples uh, you can uh, conclude but at the same time uh, if it is a 15 marker question you will also have to write some negatives like what we discussed with the friends of police moment in uh, uh, tamil nadu so how they were allegedly uh, some of the volunteers they have had this uh, high handed behavior and uh, they were also responsible for the torture of the two men who were died in custody so these kind of negative things you can also uh, write and then you can conclude with a way forward so that's it And today's question is what is the importance of solar energy and what issues or challenges are faced in developing the solar energy potential it's a 15 mark question for 150 words uh, sorry 250 words uh, to write answer that's it for today thank you